Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to give this new talk and uh, workshop on artificial intelligence. I've been passionate about artificial intelligence for ages. It's, uh, it's been almost 10 years now since I've started, you know, this big journey in AI. And so today I'm so happy to introduce to you and explain, you know, really in depth the state of the art of artificial intelligence, uh, which is uh, a branch, which actually is my favorite branch of AI that is called reinforcement learning. So we're going to cover uh, the state of the art of what we call deep reinforcement learning, which is, you know, the branch of AI that is the closest to artificial intelligence uh, in terms of how we're trying to, uh, you know, get closer and closer to human intelligence. It is with this branch that we can, for example, build uh, robots. It is with this branch that we uh, build applications that, uh, you know, uh, automate systems. It is with this branch that we uh, build applications that optimize uh, processes or optimize some outputs. Uh, basically, uh, with this branch, we can do some amazing and powerful industry applications. So, without further ado, because we have a lot to cover, uh, we will cover the whole theory of the state-of-the-art model and deep reinforcement learning that is called twin-delayed DDPG, also called TD3. Not only we will cover the theory, but also we will cover the whole implementation. So you got all the slides and, you know, the code and the uh, outputs of uh, the model we're going to build. So make sure to have, uh, to have it on your machine so that you can follow uh, with me the diverse steps of the theory, which we're going to implement step-by-step step on actually Google Colab which means that you will have absolutely nothing to worry about. Nothing will have to be installed from your side. Everything will be ready. So there we go. Let's start. So I'm going to um, share my screen. There we go. And action. All right. So let's start. I hope you can all see my screen. And this is the beginning of our journey here. TD3, which means actually Twin Delayed DDPG. So... We're going to cover and, uh, you know, our plan of attack will be structured in three parts. In part one, we will uh, study all the fundamentals that you need to understand the twin delay DDPG, you know, the theory. Then in part two, we will cover step by step the theory of this model. You know, how it works, not only how we build it, but also how we train it. And you will get all the little details step by step. And you will see that during part three, which will be the implementation of the twin delay DDPG, well, we will do nothing else than implementing each of the steps of part two, you know, the part two of the theory. So that's our structure, and therefore, let's start right away with the fundamentals. All right, part one, fundamentals. What are the fundamentals that we're going to need for to understand the theory of the twin delayed DDPG? All right, so first, you need to understand how a reinforcement learning environment works. So it works the following way. You have the environment, which is right here. So this is the example of a maze, you know, where an agent, meaning a little robot, has to find, you know, the exit or, you know, the, the goal inside the maze. And uh, the way it does this is that iteration by iteration, it will play a certain action within a certain state. And as soon as it plays the action, it will receive a reward. And, you know, just as we are trying to educate a dog or trying to educate a, a child, well, that's the same principle. We're going to give a positive reward to the agent if the agent is uh, getting closer to the goal. And we're going to give a negative reward if the agent is either getting further from the goal or, you know, if it, uh, uh, for example, goes into some trap within the maze. And that's si as simple as that. It simply works this way. Um, and if you want to go more in the theory, the, the process that is happening, you know, once the agent plays an action, gets reward, reaches the next state and enters a new state from which it's going to play once again an action, is called a Markov decision process, MDP. But that's, um, you know, more deep in the theory, which we don't have, uh, which we don't really need right now to cover the fundamentals. All right. So that's the first fundamental. Then we're going to jump quite a higher level, which, which is deep Q learning. That's the second fundamental you'll need to understand the twin delay DDPG. So deep Q learning is simply the association of deep learning and Q learning. So don't worry if you know nothing about this. I'm going to remind the most important principles that you need to understand uh, deep Q learning. So first, the, the first thing we need to understand here is the Q 
learning process, or you know the Q values. The Q value is a value that measures the quality of the action played by the agent. So you know the agent is in a certain state and it will play an action to reach the next state. And the Q value, which is actually a function taking as input the state and the action, measures the quality of playing that action within a certain state. And therefore, it will be high if that action played in that certain state gets the agent closer to the goal, and it will be low if that action played within the certain state uh, gets the robot further from the goal. So you see, it's simply a measure of the quality, and that's exactly how you must see it. So that's the first fundamental in deep Q learning. Then you need to understand that um, the, com the combination of Q learning with deep learning. So as you probably heard before, deep learning consists of building an artificial neural network, which takes as input uh, some observation of the environment, which is called uh, either some input information or in in our case here, the state of the environment, and will return as output uh, a prediction, you know, something we want to predict. And in fact, well, what, it, what will be returned right now in this uh, deep Q-learning model is exactly the Q-value. So we have a deep learning model, we have an artificial neural network that will take as input the state of the environment and also the action plate, and will return as output the Q-values. And why do we see Q1 ver versus Q target 1, Q2 versus Q target 2, etc.? That's because the way it works is that there is a target of the value we want to predict. And our goal, you know, the goal of the artificial neural network is by iter iteration by iteration to predict values that are getting closer and closer to the target. Okay, so that's the fundamental principle. We have a target and we have an artificial neural network that returns predictions, and the goal is to return predictions, meaning predicted Q values, that are getting closer and closer to the target. And of course, the targeted Q values will be high Q values. Why is that? That's because, remember, the Q value measures the quality of the state action pair, and therefore we want to find the state action pairs leading to high Q values, because that's the, that corresponds to the actions that get the agent closer to the goal. All right, so here I've uh, included the whole deep Q learning process, which works this way. First, you initialize the experience replay memory. It is initialized as an empty list. You choose a maximum size of the memory. And then at each iteration, you're gonna predict the Q values of the current state in which the agent is at, a spe at this specific time. Then you're gonna play the action that has the highest Q value then you get the reward, and then you reach the next state. And all this gives you a transition, because a transition is composed of the current state, ST, the action played, AT, the reward received, RT, and the next state reached, ST plus one. And you append that transition, that new transition, in the memory. Then, you know, once you start getting enough transitions, you know, many, many transitions, well, you're gonna take a random batch of these transitions, meaning, a, su a subset of these transitions. And for all the transitions within the batch, well, first, you're going to get the predictions, which, as I told you, is exactly the predicted Q values, meaning the Q values predicted by our artificial neural network here. Then you're going to get the target. And OK, so this formula is coming from the very famous Bellman equation, which is at the heart of reinforcement learning and more specifically Q learning. That's how we compute the target Q values. Where does it come from? Well, that comes from the fact that it represents the expected return. That's, you will see in many, you know, for example, I recommend the Reinforced Mirroring Boy by Richard Stodden. You will see that the expected return, meaning the accumulated reward, but expected, you know, uh, by computing the expected uh, value of the reward, well, is exactly given by this formula. And therefore, since you want to optimize, since you want to maximize the expected return, meaning the accumulated future rewards, well, you want to have these as targets for the prediction of the Q values, because the Q values represent exactly the quality of the state action pairs. So 
That's your target. That's very important to understand this. That's what you want to get the Q values close to. Okay. And then the classic way to, uh, you know, get predictions that are, that you want to get closer and closer to the target is by first computing the loss between these predictions here and the targets here. I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying this in the plural because, you know, we are in a batch and therefore we have several Q values and therefore several targets. So you compute the loss between the predictions and the targets over the whole batch. And this is therefore, you know, the formula of the loss. So you sum all these differences, you know, let's take it step by step. So this is the target right here. This is the prediction right here. And therefore this is the square difference between the target and the prediction. Okay, and then you take the sum here because you have to consider all the targets and predictions of the whole batch, and then uh, you, you take the square differences. And therefore, you have to, you know, uh, reduce this because you want to get, you want to reduce the loss. You want to get your predictions close to this. So you want to reduce the loss. And the way you're going to do this is by applying back propagation. You know, you're going to back propagate this loss back into the neural network that's called back propagation it's a fundamental principle in deep learning and then you're going to apply stochastic de gradient descent with an optimizer to update the weights inside the neural networks you know you have a weight corresponding to each of the neurons here you know between the neurons you have to update each of the weights so as to reduce that loss at the next iteration and the way to do this is indeed with stochastic gradient descent and with usually the use of an optimizer. The most classic one for SGD is the Atom Optimizer, and it is the optimizer, indeed, the most widely used in, uh, you know, the deep learning implementations. Okay, so that's the fundamentals of deep learning. Basically, what you have to remember right now, you know, if this feels a bit overwhelming, if this is the first time you see it, the thing that you have to do right now, that you have to remember right now, is that you want to reduce that loss between the targets and the predictions, which measures, in fact, the error between the targets and the predictions. All right, so now let's move on to the next fundamental. I'm good, just going to drink a bit of water. All right, so the next fundamental is about policy gradient. So policy gradient is different. It's the exact opposite as before. You know, before with deep learning, we were trying to reduce something. We were trying to minimize something, which was the loss. But now, on the contrary, we're going to try to increase something. We're going to try to maximize something, which is, once again, the expected return. Because at the end of the day, this is exactly what we want to, uh, you know, maximize or increase. Because indeed, as I've told you, the return is well, the, the accumulated reward, you know, the sum of the future rewards that you're going to get uh, over the iterations and expected, meaning that you take the expected value, you know, the expected function of the return at the origin, you know, the first uh, t equals zero, one you start. So that's your ultimate goal. You want to maximize this. And the way you're going to do this is by applying what we call deterministic policy gradient. So what does it consist of? It simply consists of first taking the expected return, meaning this, and then you're going to apply what we call gradient ascent, meaning that you're going to take the gradient of the expected return with respect to the weight of the neural network that, you know, takes as input the state and return as output the actions. In other words, this is the neural network of the policy meaning the agent that performs the actions over time. So, you know, you have the agent that takes as input the state, the state of the environment, you know, what's happening right now at a specific time in the environment, and returns as output the actions to play in order to reach its goal. That's what is called the policy. And that's exactly what you're going to take. You know, you're going to take the weight of this policy inside that gradient because that's what you want to update. You know, you want... You want to update the parameters of the policy through gradient ascent because by applying gradient ascent, you're going to increase this, meaning you're going to update the weights of your policy to increase that expected return. And that's exactly how you do this. So here, this equation means that 
the weight at time t plus one, you know, the weight of this neural network representing nothing else than the agent, or also called the policy, the weights are going to be updated the following way. So you're going to take the weight at the you know, previous step, you know, the current state. You're going to add to this the gradient of the expected return with respect to the parameters of the policy, to which, which you're going to multiply by alpha, which is the learning rate, which allows you to control the speed of the learning process. You know, if you have a high learning rate, you're going to have high updates, and therefore you're going to have... Uh, you're going to train your policy pretty fast. And if you have a low learning rate, well, you, have, you will have very small updates of the weights, of the parameters, and therefore your um, policy will take longer to train. Okay? So, if this is overwhelming, if this is the first time you see this, what you must remember right now is that we want to apply policy gradient so that to increase or you know, maximize the expected return by applying gradient ascent with respect to the weights of the policy, meaning that we're going to up the, update the weights of the policy in order to apply, in order to increase at the next iteration, the expected return. Okay? And that was the other fundamental. And then we have one last one, which is actor critic. So actor critic is two models working together. You have first the actor represented by a neural network, which, take, which takes as input the state and returns as output the action. So in other words, it's exactly your agent. And then you have the critic, which takes as input the state action pairs, you know, and returns as output the Q value, which are, of course, the predicted Q values. So you have these two models working together. And now guess what? You know exactly what to do with each of them. Because with the actor, you're going to want to apply deterministic policy gradient to maximize the expected return and to do so, you're going to update, you know, you know, you're going to compute the gradient of the expected return with respect to the weight of the actor, the neural network of the actor, so as to increase at the next iteration the expected return. And then with the critic, you know what to do. You're going to apply this time deep learning, you know, with back propagation and stochastic gradient descent to reduce the loss between the Q values, which are the output predictions of the critic, and um, between these predictions and the target Q values, which, as we saw, is exactly this value here, okay? So remember this, with the actor, you want to increase or maximize something, and you're going to apply gradient ascent, and with the critic, you want to minimize, decrease, or minimize something, and you're going to apply gradient descent. all right? So we have two models working in parallel at the same time, but still with that same goal, which is to maximize the expected return. So that was, you know, the previous state-of-the-art model. We had excellent results with this one. We used the actor critic to uh, uh, complete the same actions and complete, complete the same applications as the one we're about to do, and we're going to get to that very close. But now there is an innovation you're going to see because the twin delay DDPG consists of adding something else to this scheme, you know, to the scheme of composing a composed of the actor and the critic. And we're going to see exactly what are these things, but you can already guess by the name of the model, twin delay DDPG, that we're going to have some twins at some point. And we're getting, we're getting to that very soon. All right, so that was what, what needed for the fundamentals. So now we can start part two, and you will see we will build the twin delay DDPG and even train it step by step. You know, I will, t I will show you each of the steps of the construction process and then the training process of the twin delayed DDPG. All right. So, step one. As you see, you know, we're going to uh, cover it step by step. And step one is the initialization step. We actually have in three steps of initialization. That is why I'm, uh, you know, going to separate initialization here with then training. So basically, this first section, initialization, is more or less the construction of the model. You know, we're going to build the different parts of the neural networks, the different neural networks. We're going to build, build the twins and everything, and even the experience replay memory. And then, once we're done with the initialization, we will start the training process, and I will show you exactly what's happening at every iteration. All right, so step one. So step one is to initialize that experience replay memory, which, remember, 
contains the, diver the different transitions that we have at each iteration. I remind that a transition is composed of the current state, ST, the next state, ST plus 1, the action played, and the reward. So here we initialize the experience replay memory with a size of 20,000, meaning that the maximum size of that memory is 20,000 transitions, meaning that memory will contain not more than 20,000 transi transitions. And we will populate that experience memory with each new transition that is happening at each iteration, right? Because at each iteration, the agent plays an action, therefore reaches the next state and uh, receives a reward, and therefore that gives a new transition. So let me you know, allow you to visualize exactly the experience replay memory. Here it is. That's the experience replay memory with at time step one, you know, the first iteration, the first transition composed of the current state, you know, the first state uh, in basically where the agent starts, in which state, then the next state, you know, the state reached when the agent plays the action, which is this one, A1. That's, of course, the action played, and that's the reward received. So that's a transition, that's the first transition, and it is appended to the memory. Then, I will, you will see later how it is appended to the memory. Then this is the second transition, composed of the second state, the next state after that, the action, second action played, and the reward received, and etc. And, you know, once the agent plays over time, well, that experience replay memory gets populated with the different transitions. All right, you're going to see that you're going to visualize everything as well. You know, you won't only get text or hear words from me. Everything that I say will be represented on these slides. All right, so now we move on to step two. So far, no, nothing complicated. We just built an experience replay memory, which will get over time the, diver the different transitions. So step two. Step two is we start building, you know, the whole neural networks of the twin delay DDPG. And we're going to have many neural networks, actually. Don't be scared, but we're going to have actually six neural networks. And here we start by building two neural networks. So we build one neural network for the actor model and one neural network for the actor target. What, is it, what does that mean? It means that we're not only going to have the actor model, which is, you know, the agent itself, right? There is no mystery about the actor model. It's going to be exactly the neural network of your agent, or, you know, also called the policy, meaning the agent, which will take as input the state of the environment and which will return as output the action plate. So we're going to have this one, but also we want to build one other neural network representing the actor target, meaning that we're going to try to uh, modify this actor model over the iterations to make it become the actor target. We want, it, we want this actor model, we want our agent to become this one because this one will be optimized over time. And we will see exactly how it will happen. Okay, so I promised you that we were going to visualize everything. So, here, so there we go. The visualization of step two is the following. This is exactly what we built. We built, as, as, as I told you, an actor model, which is exactly your policy, which is a neural network taking as input the state and returning as output the actions to play. Why did I put several actions here? That's because you're going to see that the application we're going to build for our twin delay DDPG will actually have several continuous actions can, that can be played within each iteration. And you will understand very soon why. Okay, and then we have, as I told you, the actor target, which still take, takes the state as input and returns the actions as output. But that's not our real policy. That's what we want our policy to become. Okay, so now this next slide is about, you know, the real architecture that we're going to build for our actor model and our actor target, meaning that that's the input layer. And then in the first hidden layer, we're going to have 400 hidden neurons. Why is that? That's because you're going to see that the application we're going to build will be pretty complex. So we want a high dimensionality here in order to crack this. Okay? So 400 hidden neurons in the first hidden layer. Then we're going to have an, a rectifier activation function between the first uh, input layer and the, uh, sorry, the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer. 
which will contain this time 300 hidden neurons. Then we're going to have another rectifier activation function between the stack second hidden layer and the final output layer, which will of course contain the actions. And to return the final actions, we're going to have a tangent hyperbolic function. And then, same for the actatoriate, we're going to have the exact same architecture. However, they will be initialized in different ways. We will see that at the end in steps 14 and 15. So you will see that the octomodal and the octatoriate, you know, their neural network, will be different. Okay, now let's move on to step 3. Now we're getting closer to the final scheme of the twin delay DDPG. Because step 3 is about building two neural networks for the critic models and two neural networks for the two critic targets. Remember, I showed you how the actor critic model worked. It consisted of having one actor model and one critic model. Now this time we have one actor model, but we also have one actor target. And this time, instead of having one critic model, like in the actor critic model, we're going to have two of them. And that, of course, corresponds to the twin part of that huge name, the twin delay DDPG. Then I will explain later on where the delayed part comes from and where the DDPG comes from. And TD3 is just a shortcut name for all this. Okay? So, we're going to build two critic models and two critic targets, only neural networks. And here, what we get. So, as you understood, the critic models and their target as well are neural networks that take as input the states action pairs. Why do I say states and not state? That's because we always work with batches. We never work with single inputs. We work with batches because that's what is expected by the future neural networks. So we have all the state action pairs in the batch. And for each of them, well, the critic model returns the Q value. Okay, the Q value, which I remind, measures the quality of your state action pairs. You know, more specifically, your actions within a given state. And the higher is the Q value, the higher is basically the expected return, and therefore, the closer you, you know, the agent reaches the goal. That's really what you must keep in mind. And so we build these two critic models, which are the twins and their twin targets. And once again, we're going to do a lot of updates, we're going to do a lot of computations, you know, we're going to do some gradient descent to reduce the loss between the Q predicted Q values and their targets. And at the same time, we're going to have this critic target that we're going to try, that we're going to work so that our critic models get closer and closer to these critic targets. But that will become much later. Okay, so as I told you, now we're, very, we're getting very close to the final scheme of the twin delay DDPG because indeed, um, that's the, by the way, the architecture of the critic models and the critic targets, and it's exactly the same architecture as before with 400 hidden neurons in the first hidden layer and 300 hidden neurons in the second hidden layer, and the same rectifier activation functions. But what I really wanted to show you is the final scheme of the twin delay DDPG, which is exactly this one. All right, so we have our Arctic model, which is our policy to our agent or, you know, our little robot, and we have our Arctic target. And we're going to try to modify the weight of the Arctic model to make it become closer to the Arctic target. And at the same time, we have these twins, as opposed to the classic actor critic model, which only had one critic model. And not only we have these twins, but also for each of them, well, we have their targets. So you see... That's the whole scheme of the twin delay DDPG. We have six neural networks, but don't freak out. You're going to see exactly what's going to happen during the training process step by step. You're going to see everything that's happening in the details so that you understand how the twin delay DDPG will be trained to accomplish a certain goal. And now I'm going to explain exactly what will be this goal, you know, before we start the training process. All right. So, here is the application. Basically, we're going to build um, a robot. So, we're going to train a robot to walk and even run across a field. This is in three dimensions, and we're going to integrate the twin delay DDPG within this little robot to train it 
on how to walk and run across a field. Okay, so how does it work? Now, what is really important to understand? Uh, what's really important to understand is the environment. You know, what are the states basically and what are the actions? So, the states are the positions of the diverse mechanics elements within that robot. You know, the axis, the rotors, the different, you know, all the mechanical features that allow to understand where this robot is and also the velocity, you know, to understand where it's going. But not only one velocity, of course, the velocity of each of these muscles. So basically, these are all the features that allow to understand what is going on at each time of the environment. That's the state. Now for the actions, these are going to be the muscle impulsions of each of, you know, the different body parts of the robot. So you have, for example, a muscle impulsion on the left leg, left leg, one on the right leg, and also, you know, some here, and maybe some here as well to, you know, find balance. I'm not an expert in uh, robotics or, you know, uh, mechanics, but I understand that indeed, as like we humans need, we need some muscle impulsions in the diverse parts of our body to walk, not only to move forward, but also to find balance. And here, that's exactly the same. This is a simulation of a robot walking, and therefore you have some muscle possessions in the diverse body parts of this robot, you know, this humanoid, and this is exactly what are going to be your actions played. And that's why, you know, we have several actions. You know, we have several actions played here. I showed three, but of course, there are many more than that. There are like maybe pro probably, I don't know, tens of, uh, tens of actions, maybe 50 or something like that. I don't know the complexity of the mechanics, but it is a really good mechanics. It is actually PyBullet, which is a Python library to do exactly this, you know, to uh, work with virtual robots that uh, walk across the field or even play football. You have many diverse applications. But as you imagine, well, we have many muscle pulsations within the robot. And these are exactly the actions. Okay, so that's your actions. Now we understand the environment. And, well, this is exactly what we're going to try to make work by building the twin delay DDPG, integrate it inside the robot, and train it so that we can train, after all, a robot to walk and run across a field. So, speaking of robots now, we have several applications. We have the half cheetah in two dimensions. Basically, I can show this to you right now, actually, because um, I gave you... Actually, well, I, I'm going to show you the results at the end. It's better. I prefer to, you know, uh, leave you the surprise. But you have several applications. You have the half cheetah. Half because it's in 2D. So this one is not that challenging. I actually cracked this with another model called the ARS, Augmented Random Search, which is a model I, st I um, taught uh, back in 2018. Uh, so, you know, that's, that, was a, that, was not a, that was not a big deal. However, and that was not a big deal because it was in two dimensions. However, you have some other environments in 3D, like this one, but this one is very, very challenging, and actually you would need uh, some powerful computers to make it work. But you also have the ant, and this is a, a, you know, a virtual ant, like a virtual robot with four legs in 3D, three dimensions, which increases the complexity of the environment, and you have to train it to walk and run across a field. And that's exactly what we're going to apply our twin delay DDPG. This is much more challenging than the half cheetah because the half cheetah is in 2D, therefore in a less complex environment with less, you know, parameters that and the uh, ant is in 3D, three dimensions, with therefore much higher complexity and much more parameters to train. So we're going to apply the twin delay DDPG to that, and you will see that the results are absolutely fantastic. And you have to understand that back at the time in 2018 when I taught the ARS, well, the ARS was not powerful enough to train this ant in three dimensions to walk and run across a field. So the innovation and you know the advancement in this with this twin delay DDPG is that it can you know solve more complex problems and actually in a very very small amount of time. You know, it you only have to train it for one hour or two, which of course we won't have time to do this. So that's why I left the results and I will show you the final results in the videos that I got, you know, literally 
two days ago by training it again. And that's exactly what, you know, we're going to apply our twin delay DDPG on. So now let's go back to the training process with, you know, the very beginning. We're going to run a full episode. You know, a full episode is uh, to uh, try to, uh, you know, it's one uh, um, part of time where this robot is going to try to walk. And if it falls on the ground, well, that's the end of the episode. Or, you know, if it manages to walk for a certain time, well, the end of the episode will be, for example, 20 seconds. It's not going to run forever. It's going to run for a certain amount of time, which is uh, usually 20 seconds or 15 seconds. And that's the end of the episode. Okay? So that's what an episode means. And so we're going to run a full episode with first 10,000 actions played randomly. So you can imagine that within a full episode, you're going to have many, many actions played, you know, tens of thousands, but we're going to take just for the first 10,000 actions played randomly, and that's only so that we can collect some information, so that, you know, all these neural networks here can collect some information, okay? And then, uh, we, uh, after the 10,000 actions, you know, after the first 10,000 actions are played randomly, well, this time, we're going to use our neural networks to, you know, the neural network of the actor model, meaning the policy, meaning the robot, to play the next actions, okay? So that's what happens at the very, very beginning. Then, let's see what happens. Step four. Okay, so, since we started by running a full episode with first 10,000 actions, you understand that this gives us also 10,000 transitions. Because each time we play an action, well, we reach a next state, S prime here. You know, this is represented by S prime. And also we receive a reward. The agent receives a reward. So each time the agent plays an action, we get indeed these four elements. The current state, the next state, the action plate, and the reward receives. And so we have all these transitions in the memory. You know how we have these 10,000 transitions plus the ones once we start to play the actions from the actor model. And therefore we can start by sampling a batch of transitions, meaning that we take some random transitions from the memory. And then let's see what's going to happen for each element of the batch. So here I'm considering a specific, you know, uh, each of the transitions of that batch that was just sampled. All right, so let's see. Uh, okay, so I made also this slide to help you visualize what a batch looks like. So these are the different transitions. This is the first transition. You can either see it as the last state or the current state, but this is the first transition, this is the second transition, this is the hundredth transition, and the reason why I put a hundred here is because I'm considering a batch size of 100, meaning that the batch that we sample here has a size of 100, meaning that we take 100 random transitions randomly from the memory, and that's what you ha have in your batch. Okay, so that's your, batches, your batch of the 100 transitions. Then, what you're going to do is separate this batch into these four separate batches. One batch for the last states, containing all the last states of the transitions. One batch for the next states, containing all the next states of the transitions. Then, one batch for the actions, containing all the actions of the transition. And one batch for the rewards, containing all the 100 rewards of the transitions. Okay? So... You have these four separate batches, and then let's see what is going to happen in step five. Well, there we go. We're going to start. Since, you know, we have these 100 transitions and we have, therefore, the next states, well, for each of the next states, S, S prime, well, the actor target is going to play the next action, A prime. And as I promised you, we're going to visualize this right now on the graph. And there it is. This is the initialization step, you know, when nothing happens. And then here is the step five. So that actor target takes as input the next state S prime and returns as output the next action to play A prime. And that's simply the next, uh, you know, that's step five. And then we're going to see what's going to happen in each of these neural networks. And you will see the final loop that is happening at each iteration. Okay? So let's do this. All right, step six now. We're going to add Gaussian noise to this next action A prime, meaning this one. 
and we're going to clamp it, meaning we're going to clip it within a certain range, which is that range of values supported by the environment, which is represented by this, meaning that this action played, you know, that next action played by the actor target taking as input the next state is going to be clipped between minus C and plus C, but at the same time, we're going to add this Gaussian noise to add some, you know, uh, randomness. And the purpose of doing this is just to make sure that we're playing actions supported by the environment. You know, we're not playing, for example, uh, some uh, nonsense action, like uh, some too high muscle pulsation, for example. Okay? So the environment has basically some certain rules of actions, uh, and we, make sh we want to make sure that we stay within the supported range of values by the environment. That's just for this. Okay, so we clip the action. And then, in step six, well, that's going to be interesting. The critic target, which I'm going to show you right away, are going to take each the couple of the next state S prime and the next action A prime as input, as, you know, is good for any critic model. And it's going to return two Q values, QT1 of S prime A prime, and QT2 of S prime A prime, right? Remember that the critic target are the, uh, the critic models and also the target are the neural networks that return the Q values. And indeed, what is going to happen on the graph is the following. So this was the step before, and now the next step is going to be this one. So the critic target is going to take that same next state, next action pair, you know, the same as what we see here, and it's going to return a first Q value, but which will represent the targeted Q value that we're going to try to get, you know, the future Q values of the critic models as close as possible by, you know, using a loss function and applying back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. And also we have our critic target twin, which is taking the exact same pair of next state S prime and next action A prime to return the targeted Q value of that second target. So here, as you can see, I'm noting this one QT1 and this one QT2. And that's simply the next step. The two correct targets return two separate Q values. Then let's see what's going to happen. Step eight. So step eight, very simple step. We're going to keep the minimum of these two, of these two Q values, mean QT1 and QT2. And it represents the approximated value of the next state. So this, what ha this is what happened before, and this is what happens now. We take the minimum of these two Q values. And that's simply the next step. Okay, now step nine. Step nine, we get the final target of the two critic models, which is QT equals R, which is the reward received in that transition we're working on right now, that specific transition, because remember, we're doing this, you know, we're doing all these steps for each element of the batch, meaning each transition of the batch. So this represents the reward received for that specific transition. And to this, we're going to add the minimum of these two Q values, meaning that value here, to which, uh, which is multiplied by a factor called the discount factor. And now I have a question for you. Does that remind you of something? Does this formula remind you of something? Well, remember, in the fundamentals, I can actually show this. No, it's too far. Uh, in the fundamentals, remember that we had the Q values, which were the predictions of the neural network, and also we had the target. The target Q values, which was the reward received plus discount factor multiplied by the Q values of the next state. Well, here, it's almost the same, but instead of taking the Q values, the maximum Q values of the next state for the diverse actions, well, we take the minimum of these Q values. So in other words, this is another representation of the target, which in the case of the twin delay DDPG is something indeed that we want to get our Q values of the critic models as close as possible. So this is our new target, but of course it reminds us very well, it is very close to the previous classic target of the deep Q learning model. Okay, so now let's see how we represent this so that you can visualize this on the graph. There we go, so that's the previous step, and now the next step becomes the following. Okay? So, uh, 
Um, all right, I just got lost for a bit. There we go. So that's the Q target. All right, the Q target is the reward received plus the discount factor gamma multiplied by the minimum of these QT1 and QT2. And then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna guess that these two Krieg models are gonna return two Q values, and we're gonna try to, uh, at the next iterations, modify the weights of these two critic models so that the returned Q values, meaning the predicted Q values of the critic models, become closer and closer to that target. So what you must remember at this stage is that this is our targeted Q value. Now let's see what is our next step. So our next step, step 10, is that the two critic models take each the couple of this time current state and action plate you know, not the next state and next action plate, but the current state and action plate of the transition, it takes that couple as input and will return the two Q values, QS1, uh, Q1 of SA and Q2 of SA as output. So let's visualize this on the graph. There we go. Here is that step. Here is that new step. So we have our first critic model that takes as input the state action pairs within the batch and will return the deferred Q values. So we have the Q value of the first critic model, Q1SA, and the Q value of the second critic model, Q2SA. So we have these two separate Q values from our two separate critic models. And now let's see what's going to happen next. I'm sure you guess actually what's going to happen next. You know, that's why I wanted to study with you and cover the fundamentals. Of course, now that we have our two Q values here and that we also had the targets, well, we're going to incur the loss, meaning the difference between the Q values and the targets, and of course, that then apply back propagation with stochastic gradient descent to update the weights of the critic models to reduce the loss between the Q values and the target. But let's see exactly we're, how we're going to do this because we here we have two Q values and one target. So let me show you exactly how, you know, will be that loss and how we're going to do this. So that leads us to the next step, step 11. So, of course, we compute the loss coming from the critic models. And that is the following. MSC means the mean square error loss, which is exactly the loss I showed you before, you know, with the sum of the square differences between the predicted Q value and the target Q value. But since this time we have two Q values and one target, well, we're going to sum these two mean squared error losses. The first one corresponding to the first critic model with that first returned or, you know, predicted Q value compared to the target, that same one. And then the second one, meaning the loss, mean squared error loss between the second Q value and the same target, QT. All right, so we just sum these two losses. Okay. So let's visualize these, this new step on the graph. And there it is. So we have our new critic loss. I'm, I'm talking about the critic loss, which is the sum of the mean squared error loss between the first Q value, this one returned by the first critic model, and that target QT here, and the second loss between the second Q value, meaning this one returned by the second critic model, and that same target QT here. OK? That's that new step, and of course, then you're going to see we're going to apply back propagation with a stochastic gradient descent optimizer, like the atom optimizer, to reduce that loss at the next iterations so that the two return Q values of the two critic models get closer and closer to that target Q values, which I remind represents the quality of the action. Okay, so now let's move on to the next step. Well, I just said it. The next step is, of course, to backpropagate the critic loss, meaning that loss, back into the two neural networks. Now we have two neural networks, so we're going to do two backpropagations and therefore two stochastic gradient descents. And let me show you exactly the next step 12. So we backpropagate this critic loss. And of course, that's in order to update the parameters, meaning the weights inside these two critic models, so that next time that loss is reduced. Right? And we do this with an SGD optimizer. And a great example of them is the Atom optimizer. So let's visualize that step 12 in the next graph. So that was the previous step. And now, there we go. 
I represented the backpropagation with this huge arrow because we have two backpropagations, first in this critic model, the twin, and in our first critic model. Okay? All right. So, what is going to be the next step now? Step 13. So, once every two iterations, we're going to update our actor model by performing gradient ascent on the output of the first critic model. And this formula that you see here is exactly what we saw before, you know, when I showed you policy gradient, the fundamentals of policy gradient. Except that this time, we're not trying to, we're not going to apply gradient ascent on the expected return because we actually don't know what it is, you know, it's not uh, a real value, it's just an expected value. But to approximate that expected value of the return, well, we're going to use the Q values. Because as I told you, and that's, you know, in the deeper fundamentals of reinforcement learning, the Q value can be approximated by the expected return. So we're going to use the Q value of the critic model so that we're going to apply gradient ascent onto it, but with respect to the weight of the actor model, which are exactly these, these weights, you know, phi here. We're going to apply gradient ascent with respect to these weights, and we are going to update the weights of the actor so that the actor can play actions that lead to higher and higher Q values. So let me show you what's going to happen in the next graph. So this is the previous step, and now this is the next step. Let me show you step by step because this is the part that is likely to be the most, maybe most overwhelming for you. So in the previous step, you know, we got two predicted Q values, Q1 of SA and Q2 of SA. We computed the loss between these two predicted Q values and their target so as to get them closer to their targets. So we have, over the iteration, some better and better Q values here. And now, in the next step, we're going to take that Q value, just this one, forget about this one, we're going to take the Q value Q1 of the first critic model here, and we're going to apply gradient ascent on that Q value, but with respect to the weight of the agent here. I remind that the actor model here represents exactly the agent that, you know, takes as input the states, you know, all the angles of the axis, the rotors, and uh, the positions of them, and the velocity, and returning as output the actions, which are the muscle pulsations inside the agent robot. And so, we're going to apply gradient ascent to that Q value, Q1 here, which is optimized thanks to what is happening here. And, with and we're going to apply gradient ascent to that with respect to the weight of our real actor model, you know, our agent or our policy, so that the future values of the weight, you know, after they are updated, lead to, you know, higher and higher Q values here. Here we're trying to get them closer to the target, and here we're trying to maximize them or increase them. Because remember that they measure the quality of the state action pairs. So by increasing them, that leads us to better weights, which will therefore play some better actions, therefore getting the agent closer to the goal. Okay? And if you want the details of that math formula, that is coming from the chain rule, which, because, you know, at first we just want to apply the gradient ascent on Q theta 1, but where this action here is equal to, uh, you know, what is played by the policy. You know, this is, this represents, the pi here represents the policy. This represents the parameters of the policy. You know, that phi here represents the parameters of the policy, and S is the state. So what happens is that here A is replaced by this, and that's what we want to apply the gradient on at the very beginning. But the chain rule means that, you know, you first apply the gradient to this, where A is equal to what is returned by the policy, and then you multiply by the gradient of the policy applied to the state with respect to the weight of the neural network. And here, theta 1, not to confuse, are the weights of the critic model. Okay? So, make sure to re read that formula, you know, peacefully, because now, you know, we are covering this whole theory in two hours, and besides, we have the implementation after. But, there you go. 
That's what you must. That's what you have to understand. We are trying to apply gradient ascent to that optimized Q value of the first critic model, so as to update the weights, therefore leading to better actions, therefore getting the actor model, you know, the agent closer to the goal. Okay, so that's almost the last step. But then we have some other steps, which are the following. Still, because as you notice, you know, so far all we've done are to, you know, compute the target Q values, then get the predicted Q values, then incur the loss to optimize the Q values, then we apply gradient ascent here, which therefore update these weights in the correct models and the weight in the actor model, but we have not touched, you know, the weights of these neural networks here. These are still intact. We have not modified them. And well, this is what the last two steps here are going to do. We're going to update the parameters of these model. Okay? So let's see how we're going to do that. So, still once every two iterations, that's important and I will explain why later on, we're going to update the weight of the critic target by applying what we call Poliak averaging. So, here, let's make sure everyone understands the parameters. This is the, these are the parameters, these are the weights of the critic target. Okay? Then, these are the weights of the critic models. And once again, this is, these are the weights, the same weights of the critic models. But this, uh, these are before we apply the updates, and these are after the updates. And this tau here is a very, very small value. You know, like, for example, 0 0.001. So that this is a very small value, and this is a value very close to 1. So now, let me show you exactly what's going to happen on the graph, and I'm going to show you why we do this, and what it's going to do to our create targets, which we haven't modified yet. All right, so this is what happened before, and this is what is happening now. So, as you can see, the critic target here is modified the following way, by applying a very, very light change by taking the parameters of the critic model and by uh, almost not modifying the original version of the critic target. Because since this tau here is very, very small, and since this theta i here corresponds to the parameters of the critic model, well, that means that here, you see, we are taking a little bit of the critic model and we are removing a little bit, you know, because this is close to one, this is just slightly before one, and this corresponds to the parameters of the correct target. So that means that here we are removing a bit of the correct target. And therefore, what does this mean? Well, that means that we are modifying very slightly the critic target to very slightly get it closer to the correct model, and at the same time, very slightly, you know, get it, uh, um, get it further away from the original, uh, from the previous version, of the create target. And why do we do this? That's because we want to give some time for the critic models to learn from the critic target. Because if we modify them too quickly, you know, for example, with the high tau here, then the critic target will become too close to the critic model, and then all that we're doing here won't make sense, because we will have a critic target already very close to the critic model. And so here, we want to modify the correct target very slightly by, at each iteration, taking a little bit here of the correct model and removing a little bit here of the correct target. And that's exactly what Polyak averaging is all about. Okay? And now, finally, final step. Still once every two iterations, we update the weights of the actor target, still by Polyak averaging. So these are the weights of the actor target. This is, these are the weights of the actor model, and these are the weights of the actor target. And still, the same tau, a very small value, so that here we take a little bit of the actor model, and here we withdraw a little bit of the actor target. And let's see what happens in the final step. So here, the actor target, indeed, we here take a little bit of the actor model, because these corresponds to the parameters of the actor model, and here we withdraw a little bit, or, you know, we remove a little bit of the actor target because this corresponds to the parameters of the actor target, and this is a value very close to 1. All right, so that's what is Polyak averaging. We will see how we implement this. And now, 
I have a question for you, which is the following. So, we're going to try to understand where each part of the, that huge name here, you know, twin delay DDPG, comes from. So, twin, of course, as we understood, corresponds to the fact that we have two twins here. You know, two twin critic models and two twin critic targets. That was obvious. But then, let's see where the delayed part comes from. Uh, according to where does it come from? Okay, let's go back and let's see the different steps. Well, the delayed part comes exactly from this. The fact that we're updating our actor model and also our critic targets and our actor targets once every two iterations. That's where the delayed part come from. And why do we do this? That's, of course, because by doing some research, you know, when the research scientists implemented and invented the theory of the twin delay DPG, they noticed a better performance if we have, you know, if we apply these updates once every two iterations. Okay, that's just a matter of performance seeking. And so these two uh, updates every, once every two iterations is exactly where the delayed part comes from. And now let's see this. So the first D, what does it correspond to? It corresponds to deep, deep. And that's because, you know, the neural networks are deep neural networks, right? We have at least two hidden layers. And, you know, uh, we can have many more hidden layers. But these are deep neural networks as opposed to shallow neural networks. And that for both the actor models and the critic models. Okay. Now the next D, but actually I will take all this, DPG, which corresponds to deterministic policy gradient. I showed you policy gradient in the fundamentals, but the real part of policy gradient we're doing is deterministic policy gradient, and this is exactly corresponding to what we have here. You know, that formula that is performing gradient ascent on the output of the first critic model, okay? That corresponds to deterministic policy gradient, and that is used, of course, to you know update the weights of the actor model so as to increase and maximize the Q values. Okay, great. So now that we have the whole theory, the whole 15 steps of the theory, because you know all these actually apply the training process, nothing else. Then we have some other methods and functions that will make the whole thing run, but these are essentially the whole steps of the training process. And now we're gonna implement all that in action, okay? So we're gonna move on now to the collaboratory file, which was shared to you. And you're gonna see that we're gonna implement each of these steps, step by step on the code, okay? So let's do this. I'm gonna switch from the slide, this slide containing all the steps and the code. So there we go. Let's do this. So you had this file, it was shared to you by email, I guess. And so either you want to recode everything, you know, the different steps if you want to practice. But of course here we don't have the time. You know, we only have two hours to cover the theory and the implementation. So I'm just gonna go over the code and I'm gonna highlight each of the different steps. And I'm gonna explain, of course, how each of these different steps are implemented. But you're gonna see that for some of them, you know, you could really re-implement this yourself before seeing the code. All right, so the name of this implementation is TD3, obviously, and the first thing we do, you know, the first cell is installing the packages. By the way, if you want to re-implement this, you have to click File here, and then click Save a Copy in Drive, because this file is in read-only mode, because you all have access to it, and of course you can't modify it, otherwise, you know, we would get totally lost. So. This is in read-only mode, we're going to see the code and we're even going to see the results, but if you want to re-implement some, the, you know, the different steps of the code, well, feel free to do it, but instead you have to click file here and then save a copy in drive. Okay, so first step, as I said, is to install the packages and the beauty of Google Colab is that, you know, most of the deep learning packages, machine learning packages are already installed. You have scikit-learn installed, which is one of the best data science library. You have TensorFlow installed. You have PyTorch installed. You have most of the dependencies installed. That's absolutely amazing. But PyBullet is actually a, a library that is mostly used for mechanics and uh, virtual robotics. 
And therefore, it is not part of the pre-installed package of Google Colab, so that's why we have to install this. And that's what happens in this first cell. We use this pip command followed by the exclamation mark and then install pipolet. And when you run the cell, which you can't hear because this is only read-only mode, but in your copy, if you run the cell, it will first download pipolet from the web and then install it within this notebook. Okay, so that's the first step. Then we're going to import all the libraries that we're going to need. So uh, we're not going to go over one by one, but basically the most important ones are first the PyBullet environment, which contains the environment that we're going to train our AI inside, meaning the ant in three dimensions. Then Jim. So this is a whole library that allows to do some reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning on such environments. Then we have Torch, because actually we build this twin delay DDPG with PyTorch. And in PyTorch, in the Torch library, the most important modules are this one, the NN module, which means neural network. And this is the one that allows to build any neural network. Then we have Functional, which allows to use diverse functions when you build and train a neural networks. And then, of course, we have Torch Autograd, which, you know, allows to apply gradient descent or gradient ascent which we are both going to do in the implementation. And uh, the last one is not important. Okay, so, you know, it's not important from what we saw in the theory. All right, so now we're just going to apply each of the steps one by one, you know, meaning code them one by one, and you're going to see that it, is, it will be very direct. Now that we understand the whole theory, now that we have all the different steps clearly separated and also visualized on the slides, well, this is exactly what we're going to do in the code. So step one, as we see, is to initialize the experience replay memory with a size of 20,000. And we have to populate it once we reach, you know, once we reach a new state, meaning once we have a new transition. So let's see how it is done. So since, it, since this is an advanced implementation, well, we're going to build some classes for each of our diverse tools. And of course, the experience replay memory is one tool. So we start with this class, which we call replay buffer, because we're going to do some sampling from this class, you know, to sample the different batches. And we start by initializing the memory. So we initialize it as an empty list. Then we set the maximum size, which is 20,000. And also, we have this PTR variable, which is a pointer, and which will allow to easily add some new transitions at the right index. Then we define this method to add a new transition each time we, you know, each time the agent plays a new action and therefore reaches a new state and gets a new reward. So that simply adds to transition inside the memory. And then of course we have this sample method, sample method, which will of course sample some random transitions from the memory to create the batches, you know, to get the batches which, remember, is exactly what happens here. We sample a batch of transitions from the memory, and then for each element of the batch, we're going to do all these next steps. So we indeed need that sample method in order to you know, sample the batch. Okay? So we're not going to see that in detail, because what I want to see in detail is you know, the construction process of the TD3 model itself. But feel free to have a look at this. Uh, but usually it should be direct. You know, Here we clearly you know, populate a different batch of first the states, then next states, the actions, rewards, receives, and don'ts. Don'ts mean, are we done with the episode? Is the episode over or not? Okay, so now let's move on to step two. Step two is, you know, when, when we start building the architectures of the models. And we start with the actor model and also the actor target. So we build one neural network for the actor model and one neural network for the actor target. Let's see how we do this. Step two. All right, step two, we build one neural network for the actor model and one neural network for the actor target. So once again, we build a class for that because this is an advanced structure and to, this, to which we can add some tools. And one very important tool when we build a neural network is indeed the forward method, which allows to do forward propagation to forward propagate the input states all along the neural network to get the final predicted actions, you know, the final action plate. All right, so we first start with the init method to build the architecture of the actor model with 
as I told you on the slide, a first hidden layer of 400 hidden neurons connected to the input layer of the different states. So this state dim corresponds exactly to the number of inputs in the robots at each time t. You know what I told you about the diverse positions of the axes, the rotors, the points in the robot, and also the velocity of the different parts of the body. Then we have the second hidden layer composed of 300 hidden neurons connected to the first hidden layer composed of 400 neurons with a linear transformation. Okay, and we're going to apply the rectify activation to break that linearity later on with that forward method. And then we have the third layer, meaning you know the first linear transform, uh, the third linear transformation between the second hidden layer and the fa final output layer composed of the actions, meaning composed of all the different actions that are played in each time step, which I remind are the muscle pulsations that are applied by the robot at each time step in order to walk, hopefully. All right, and then we have the Ford method, which will apply you know, the rectifier activation function first between the input layer and the, second, uh, and the first hidden layer, and then between the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer, and then at the end, between the second hidden layer and the final output layer, we, have indeed, we apply indeed this hyperbolic tangent function. Okay, the hyperbolic tangent function, which will give you the output in the best way. All right, so that's the forward method. Now let's move on to step three, which, you know, this is just the same. I applied exactly the same thing with the exact same text. So step three is to build two neural networks for the two critic models and two neural networks for the two critic targets. Two neural networks for the two critic models and two neural networks for the two critic targets. All right, let's do this. Let's see how we do this. So basically, we do the same thing as before. We make a class, and we start with the init method, which will first define the architecture of the first critic model with the two hidden layers. You know, that's exactly the same. The first hidden layer composed of 400 neurons, and the second hidden layer composed of 300 neurons. And then, here that's important, the output dimension, you know, the dimension of the output, meaning the number of cells we're going to have in the output layer, is just one, and that's because indeed the critic model returns the single Q value, right? It returns a single value. It takes as input the state action pairs and returns one single Q value. But then later on, several because we are going to have in the batch, but you know, essentially it returns one single Q value. So that's why we have a one here. And that's the same for the second critic neural network. Same architecture 400 hidden neurons in the first hidden layer. 300 hidden neurons in the second hidden layer, and one output Q value, but a different one. You know, remember that corresponds to the Q2 here, Q2, okay? All right, so we have our two architectures, we have our two critic models, and our two critic targets. So basically, we have only two architectures here, and four models here, but that's not, but that doesn't matter, because in order to uh, build these four models, we'll just have to call this class twice. We'll just have to create two different objects of this class, which therefore will give two critic models and two critic targets. Okay? All right. But then we have to build this new method, the forward method, to allow the forward propagation within each of these two critic models and two critic targets. And that's what we do here. And that's the same. We apply the rectifier activation function. Here we use this concatenation in order to put the inputs the right way because you know we have two inputs actually we have the state and the action because the critic models take the state action pairs as input so that's what this concatenation is used for we concatenate the state and the action and then there we go we apply the rectifier activation function within the hidden layers and finally well not hyper hyperbolic tangent, tangent hyperbolic tangent in the final output layer okay so that's for the forward propagation on the first critic neural network. I specified it here well. And that's for the forward propagation on the second critic neural network. And that's the same. Rectify activation function and then no act uh, hyperbolic tangent activation function. And then 
I made this final method here, which is very important, and which corresponds to exactly this. Because remember, at some point, we're going to apply gradient descent, uh, sorry, gradient ascent to that first output Q value here, Q of theta 1. Theta 1 are the parameters of the first critic model. So I also need a method which will give me that output so that I can then easily apply gradient ascent to update the weights of the actor model in order to play better actions which will increase that Q value returned by the first critic model. So I need that, and that's exactly what, is this, what this is used for. So this will return the first Q value, no, the Q value of the first critic model. Okay? Good. All right. So as you can notice, actually, this is very close to the forward propagation. We just do another forward propagation here, but we are going to use this to get that separate Q value. And then begins the training process from steps four to step 15. So let's do this. There we go. So step four, we're going to sample a batch of transitions, current state, next state, action played, reward received from the memory. And then for each element of the batch, we're going to do all these things. So let's see how it is done in the code. All right. So as you can see, now we have a huge code containing the whole training process. Okay, and I put the diverse remaining steps within this huge code, within this huge code of the training process. So we're going to see each of these steps one by one. All right, so first I made this class again, which will represent the TD3 model. This class will represent the TD3 model, and in the init method of this class, you will of course get the actor model, which is created as an object or an instance of the act class, that exact same class that we built here, allowing to build the actor model, you know, the neural network of the actor model, and also the actor target. Then, of course, we create an object for the actor target by calling the same, you know, another instance of that same actor class. Then we call the actor optimizer. Then we build R2 critics, you know, the twins, not only the twins, but also the other two critic targets. And the way to do this is, of course, by creating an instance of the critic class. And same here. So this is for the first critic model. This is for the first critic target. And we're going to call that once again at some point to create the other pair, you know, the twin. Okay? And then same, we're going to need a critic optimizer to apply stochastic gradient ascent in order to reduce the loss between the predicted Q value and the target Q value. And that's it. And then we have max section, which is the maximum, uh, you know, the upper bound of the clipping range, because, you know, remember, at some point, we need to clamp our actions in order to make sure that our agent is playing some actions that are supported by the environment. So that's what we'll be used for. Okay, then we uh, apply a new, a new method. We build a new method, which will allow to play the action, basically, from the agent. So, indeed, it gets the state first, which is the input of the agent, or, you know, the policy, and then it will uh, indeed call our actor object here, taking as input the state, and this will return exactly the action plate, which is the output of the policy. Okay, so that's how you build that select action method. And there begins the train function, that huge train function, which will contain, you know, all these steps. Okay? So now we're going to start with step four, which, remember, samples a batch of transitions containing current state, next state, action plate, reward received from the memory. So remember that everything is done into batches. Here, I, you know, for the ease of the understanding, well, I specified as we're doing in batch, and then all these steps are for each single element of the batch. So here you won't see the single element of the batch, you know, we won't do some kind of for loop. We will just do... Uh, we will just take each of the batches separately, and then we will apply the diverse steps from step 5 to step 15 to each element of the batch, okay? So, indeed, in step 4, I sampled the batch transitions, and remember for this, we have this simple method from our replay buffer class. That simple method, exactly. And so we're going to call that simple method from our replay memory object, which 
was created a bit before where was it created okay um, this was created um, can't see it exactly replay buffer let me find it again Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so it is actually, it's, it's good that we see this. It is actually an argument of the train function, as you can see here. So it will actually be created later on. You know, we'll, later on, we will create an object of the replay buffer class. And this object will be one of the inputs of the train me method here. And therefore, that's how we get it. Okay, because as you can see, after the steps, we have some further code. And I will show you exactly where that replay buffer class is created. So these are all the parameters, you know, that like the discount factor. And at some point we will create the replay buffer class and it, and it is right here. You know, we create the experience replay memory by creating an object of the replay buffer class. That's the memory. And then in the training, you know, the final training, when we call everything, you know, when we run everything, well, indeed that replay buffer object will become an, uh, an argument of that train function, which is called actually right here. You see, policy, which is another object of the TD3 class that we are studying right now. We call this train method, and there we go. There is the replay buffer class. All right, so now you connect, you start connecting a bit everything. And now let's go back to our different steps. All right. So train, we have our replay buffer class. And now in the step four, we're going to, you know, sample the batch, which gives us, you know, thanks to the sample method of the replay buffer instance of the replay buffer class. Well, we have the batch states first, the batch of the states, then the batch of the next states, then the batch of the actions and the batch of the rewards, and then the batch of dons saying, if yes or no, we're done with the episode. And then remember, we get these different batches. You know, so this is going to be a state from the batch of the states, the next state from the batch of the next states, the action from the batch of the actions, and the reward from the batch of the rewards, and then the done from the batch of dons. Okay, so we have all these different batches. And now let's see what we do in step five. Well, the actor target plays the next action A prime from the next state S prime. All right, and so to do this, well, we take our actor target to which we input the next state. And, you know, by just calling this, this will call the forward method because this is the only method of the class and it will return the next action. So, basically, we get this, you know, without the... Okay, we get this, we get this state. Okay, then step six. Actually, I made these other slides to show you again. So, basically, we get these steps here with step six, uh, with step five. All right, so step six, we add Gaussian noise to this action A prime and we clamp it in a range of values supported by the environment. And to do this, we're going to use, of course, that max action parameter that we have here. And this will, you know, be specified later when we set the values of all the parameters further along in the code. Okay, so we make this noise, we clip uh, with the Gaussian noise, and then we clip the next action you know, in that range between minus max action and plus max action. And at the same time, we add this Gaussian noise to add some, uh, you know, Gaussian noise to the action so that we can add some randomness when playing our actions later on. And that's, allow, that's allowed to do what we call exploration in reinforcement learning. Exploration is when you want to, you know, consider uh, diverse actions so that to explore where they go, where they lead your AI. Okay, so that's step six. And now, step seven, let's see. Step seven, the two correct targets take each the couple of next state S prime and next action A prime as input and return two Q values, QT1 S prime A prime and QT2 S prime A prime as outputs. Let's visualize this once again. This is exactly what happens here. 
first create target gets the first target Q value QT1, and the second create target takes the second gets the second target Q value QT2. All right, so let's see how we do this. Well, that's very simple. Now we have all our tools. So that's where you know you can really try and practice to re-implement this yourself. Because indeed, you just need to take your critic target and take the right input of it, meaning the next state and the next action which you got from your batches that were sampled before in step four, and this will return your two target Q1, which is a target Q value one, and target Q2, which is a target Q value two. Because indeed, when building your critic neural networks, you made these forward method that returns these two you know, outputs of the first Q target Q value and the second target Q value. So you have everything. Okay, then step eight, let's see what happens in step eight. Remember, we take the minimum of the two target Q values of QT1 and QT2. So here, very simply, we do this this way. We use the min function by the torch library of these two target Q values, target Q1 and target Q2. That gives us the minimum here. And then let's see, what is the next step? Well, we get the final, remember, target Q value. QT, which is the sum of the reward, plus the minimum of these two Q values, which was just computed before, multiplied by the discount factor gamma. And that's exactly what we do here. The final target Q value is the reward coming from the sample batch plus one minus done, which is a trick to, you know, you know, if done is equal to one, meaning if the episode is over, then we won't take this because this will be equal to zero and we just take the reward. And if the episode is not over, done is equal to zero, so this is equal to one, and indeed we get the final uh, part of the formula, meaning the discount factor gamma multiplied by the target Q value, meaning the minimum of these two. And that gives our final target Q value. And that's step nine. Now let's move on to step 10. Remember, step 10 is to get this time the two Q values, meaning the two predicted Q values from our two critic models. So we get these two, and we have everything we need to get these two because we have this critic object represented, representing the two critic models, the two critic neural networks. And as we implemented well the Ford method when building the critic class, well, indeed, we get, well, our two predicted Q values, X1 and X2, which are given exactly here, current Q1 and current Q2. All right, we're getting close to the end. Now remember what is the next step? Well, we incur the loss. We compute the critic class, which is the sum of the mean squared error loss between the first predicted Q value Q1 and the target QT, and the mean squared error loss between the second Q predicted Q value Q2 of the second critic model and the same target Q value QT. And this is exactly what we get here. So F is the functional module by PyTorch from which you can get access to the mean squared error loss function, which takes as input, well, these two Q values, the real one, the predicted one coming from the first critic model and the target Q value, and then the loss of the target, uh, the loss between the predicted Q value of the second critic model and the same target Q value. Okay, so you have your loss, and then of course, the next natural step is to apply back propagation in both critic models so that to update the weights in the two critic models so that their predicted Q values Q1 and Q2 can get closer and closer to the target Q value QT. And that's exactly what is happening here. We take, well, we first initialize the gradient of our critic models, uh, sorry, the critic models optimizer. Then we apply backward propagation, meaning that we back propagate the critic class within the two critic models by calling this backward function from the critic class object. And then we call our optimizer with the step method, which will perform stochastic gradient ascent to update the weights inside the critic model so that next time, next iterations, they can return Q values that are getting closer to the target. All right. Then, next step. Step 13. Remember, step 13, 
But remember something important? The delayed part? Once every two iterations, well, we're going to take that output of the first Greek model, you know, the output Q value, and we're going to apply gradient ascent to update the weights inside the actor model as to increase that Q value. You know, we want to maximize it because it represents, you know, to simplify things, it represents the expected return. It is an approximation of the expected return, so we want to maximize it. And so we're going to apply gradient ascent, right, to increase it, but to update the weights in order to increase it. And we will then get some better actions leading to higher Q values here, and therefore getting the actor closer to the goal. Okay, and that's our next step here. Let's see how we do this. Step 13, once every two iterations, we update our actor model by performing gradient ascent on the output of the first critic model. So if it modulo policy frag equals zero here is a trick to do that every two iterations, because basically that means it is divided, uh, divisible by two. And there we go. We Okay, so I call this variable actor loss to take the critic uh, model. Uh, you know, we take the output Q value of the first critic model, Q1. Remember that Q1 method we made before. So we have this critic model. Then I take the minus of that which is just a trick because, in fact, instead of applying gradient ascent on the Q1 here function, well, I'm going to apply gradient descent on the minus Q1 function, which is exactly the same, right? And, indeed, that's exactly what happens next. I take the optimizer of the actor model, I initialize it with the zero graph function, then I call this backward method from the actor loss object to perform back propagation within this actor model neural network and then I'm calling this step method from the actor optimizer object in order to perform stochastic gradient descent but to the minus of what we want to maximize here. Therefore, you know, we want to maximize this, maximize this and therefore to do that we would need to apply gradient ascent but maximizing this is the same as minimizing this and therefore, to this, we can apply gradient descent. All right, so that's the little trick here because that's, there is no function for gradient descent. There is only a gradient descent function, which is the step function here, okay? All right, we're getting very, very close to the end. We have only two steps left, which are the polyac averaging steps in order to update these two, all right? So first, we update the critic target by applying polyac averaging, which consists, remember, of multiplying this little value here, tau, to the parameters of the critic models by taking something of it, you know, a slight part of it, and withdrawing a slight part of the existing parameters of the critic targets. And that's exactly what we do here. And you recognize, you know, the formula right here. You know, tau multiplied by param data plus one minus tau multiplied by the target parameters. Okay, these are the parameters of your critic models. And these are the parameters of your target models. And then step 15, we do the same for the critic targets. Well, I actually did the uh, other order here for the actor and then the critic. But that's the same. Okay? So that's public averaging. And then we have some uh, final methods. You know, the save method, the load method. So this allows to save the parameters of your diverse models. In order to, you know, if you want to pause your training, you can save your parameters and take them later, actually load them later, which is allowed by this load method here. Okay, then we make a function that evaluates the policy by calculating its average reward over 10 episodes, and that's in order to, you know, evaluate how the training is going uh, over the iterations, just so that we can keep track of how the performance is evolving. Here, that's where we set all the parameters, so this is where we choose the environment, with, which, as I told you, is the environment of the ant in three dimensions. And this is called ant bullet on v0. Then we set some seed. Then we're going to see what we have. Max time steps. So that's the maximum number of time steps, which is important, meaning that we're actually going to train our model on 500,000 time steps. And this is why it takes a couple of hours. But on my computer, it took, well, actually, on the, this Google Collab notebook, it took between one and two hours. So if you want to retrain this, feel free. You will have it very soon. Then we have the batch size of 100, remember, exactly as in the slides, the discount factor gamma of 0 
this little tau, you know, this very small parameter when we apply polyac averaging, the policy noise when we apply the clipping of the actions just to make sure they're well supported by the environment, and the policy frec, which is two, which corresponds to the delayed part, meaning that once every two iterations, we're going to update the parameters of our actor, uh, actor target and create targets. Okay, then this is just to make everything work because, you know, we're going to create a file name for the results, then same a folder that will get the results. We create the PyBullet environment with the gym library, which we imported before. Then we set some seeds uh, in the chosen environment. Then we create the policy network. So that's where we create the agent itself, the AI itself, basically, meaning exactly this one, okay? Then we create the experience replay memory, the buffer. Then we define a list where all the evaluation results over 10 episodes are stored. Okay, so that will be used for the training. This is just the benchmark uh, value. And of course, we, want, we will get much, much higher values. Then create a new folder directory with the final results. So this is where, you know, the path lead, which will lead to the final results, which I will show you in a second. We initialize all the variables to zero, basically. Then we launch the whole training by calling, you know, the train function and doing some little adjustments so that we make sure everything works properly. You can feel free to check this out in detail, but you will understand everything. This is just to connect everything. And then once we play this cell, well, there we go. The training starts. That's the beginning of the trainings with the first 1,000 time steps. So remember the, 10, the first 10,000 time steps are random actions just to collect some information, just to do some exploration basically. And then after the 10,000 time steps, well, the agent starts playing its action, and then the whole training process happens. And over time, as you can see, you want to have a look at the reward here. You want to keep track of the reward. Over time, you definitely want to see the reward increase. Basically, this is the reward of each episode. So if we scroll down, you know, over the time step, remember that there is a total of 500,000 time steps. Well, we're going to see the reward increase very well. Now it's getting close to 500. Now 500 again, 600. Then it's going back down a bit. That's because we're doing some exploration at some point. So it's classic of a reinforcement learning training process. But then it's going to increase again, you'll see. 500, 600, 700 here. 600, 500, 700. And 700, 900 here. You see it's increasing. It's very increasing. And at the same time, we want to keep track of this, the average reward over the evaluation step, because this is out of the training. So this is really what we want to see, but also the reward of the training is also giving us a hint of how the performance is evolving. So see 800, 400 again, 700. Now I'm going to scroll down faster. All right, and there we go. Here we start reaching 1,000. So that's amazing. When I saw this, I really understood that this is working very well. So 1,200, 1,400, 1,500, and I, as I told you, I was never capable of reaching these high rewards with the ARS, Augmented uh, Random Search, which was the state-of-the-art model back in 2018 or 2017. Then for 1,500, here we go back down again. That's just some exploration. Okay, that's totally normal. And then when I scroll down more, 1,800, 1,900, and very soon, we're going to get close to 2,000. There we go, 2,100. And we ended up with the beautiful, amazing, and high reward of 2,000-something in the training and also 2,100 in the evaluation. So that was the training with some evaluation steps. And at the same time, we have the inference, which is the final run after the training over one episode, well, actually over two episodes because you will get two videos. So you run everything, which just consists of repeating the steps. And over the inference episode, meaning, you know, after the training, after this trained, we got still same, an amazing reward of 2,181, which is absolutely amazing. And now let me show you the final result in the video, because you absolutely have to see this, which you will find in files, then in exp, then in BRS, and then monitor. This is just the name of the path. So here you have just the sample video. Here you have the first video, which is the first video of the inference result. And now let me show you this, because it's absolutely amazing. All right, so you see the arms walking super well. Basically, we managed to train a robot to walk 
pretty fast, you know, almost running across a field in three dimension, which therefore is in a very, very complex environment, you know, over 17 seconds. And same for this one, you will get an amazing result, you know. And this corresponds to the 2000 reward that you get at the end. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the result. I hope you enjoyed the theory and the implementation. It was a great pleasure to teach you, teach you this to you. And until next time, I'll be looking forward to teach you another model. Well, wow, that was a very in-depth workshop, Adlam. Thank you so much. I am 100% sure our audience was thrilled and they learned a bunch. I'd like to welcome you now to your very own DSGO Live Q&A. The way it works is, the attendees will send questions through the chat, I'll receive them, and I'll ask them to you. So, attendees, feel free to ask your questions through the chat. Adlam, we have a first question coming in. Um, Sashan asks, why do we need twin, ne twin networks? Um, we need twin networks because it improves the performance compared to the previous state-of-the-art models. And uh, the way, the, how, you know, how the twin networks improve the performance? Well, it's because they, have, they allow us to get some target Q-values. They allow us to get some Q-values, and by taking the minimum of these target Q-values, we basically... Um, um, add some kind of dropout regularization. You know, we add some, some regularization so that we can improve the training performance. Because instead of taking only one target Q value, we take the minimum of two, <clears throat> and therefore we leave some space to, uh, for the parameters of the diverse models to learn how to perform the you know, target goal, which is to uh, walk across the field. So this is just a trick to allow to have not only one Q-value, but several of them, and therefore to, to apply some regularization to the training process. Okay, okay, well, wonderful. Um, we have another question coming in from Javier Quintero. He asks, I have been working with genetic algorithms. It seems to me that deep Q learning works, works like them. That is right, or is that right? Yes, it's right in the sense that in the twin delay DDPG, there is a deep Q-learning process. You know, when uh, we work with the critic models and the critic targets, and we're trying to reduce the loss between the predicted Q-values and the target Q-values, well, that's exactly a deep Q-learning process happening. So indeed, the twin delay DDPG integrates the deep Q-learning process. Okay, okay, great. Um, a next question from Marcelo um, Condori. He asks, would it be possible to take more than 100 transitions how probable are the results uh, to improve with this adjustment? That's a great question. Basically, this question is about parameter tuning. Uh, you know, we have a lot of parameters in, in this uh, implementation, and one of them is, is the batch size, and which corresponds to Marshall's question. So we could very well try some other batch sizes of a bigger size, for example, a batch of 128 transitions, and perhaps we could also get some even better results. But the results we get are absolutely amazing. So I think the batch size of 100 is fine. And I think that uh, taking a, a larger batch size will uh, just lead to the same results. It won't change much. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, another question coming in from Jay Gendron. He asks, he says, excellent presentation. I can imagine business, business use cases for RL. Any that you can share? How do you think about states in, in a business case? Uh, well, first, thank you very much. And yes, I love this question. Actually, it's very funny because um, I, uh, you know, in the scope of my uh, company, Blue Life AI, I actually just had a new client. And for this new client, I'm applying the twin delay DDPG. I'm going to build a twin delay DDPG. So what is this new client? It's pretty cool. This is a client that builds robots at conferences that will, you know, take care of the guests, you know, give them... Uh, papers or even serve them drinks or uh, serve them some appetizers, anything. And so uh, we're uh, building a twin delay DDPG into these robots that will, uh, you know, serve better the attendees in conferences. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have a question also coming in from Maggie Xiao. She asks, uh, what is the purpose of clamping the Gaussian noise? Does it encourage actions with higher values mm -hmm. for polyac averaging? Is tau also a hyperparameter to be tuned? Thanks. Yeah, 
uh, once again, we only have great questions tonight, uh, today. So um, for the first question, well, we clump the actions uh, for two reasons. Well, first of all, we clump them, you know, we make them in this range just to make sure that we, the agent plays some actions that are supported by the environment, you know, that uh, it doesn't play some random uh, some nonsense muscle pulsations and the way we also include uh, the, the reason why we also include this Gaussian noise is to allow exploration It's very important in reinforcement learning to allow exploration because this allows to consider other actions than the ones that are you know uh, uh, That you that you know are being on a certain path, you know a certain uh, process by the neural network within its uh, learning process so we want to add this Gaussian noise so that we can consider some other actions that would not be considered by the neural network. Okay, wonderful. And uh, sorry, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I believe there was a, a last part of the question, which was uh, about what? Uh, there was Here, another I'll part. Say. And the full question was, what is the purpose of clamping Gaussian noise? Yes. Does it encourage actions with higher values? Or yes. For poly AK averaging, I, is tau also a hyperparameter to be tested? Yes, yes. I, I forgot the last part of the question. Yeah, yeah, great question as well. Absolutely. Tau is another uh, parameter that we can tune with other values. The only thing that matters is that we need to take a very small value, not a value close to one, a very small value, so that we make sure that you know once every two iterations we take a little part of the uh, um, model, you know whether it is the actor model or the critic model, and you know we take a large part of the critic targets or the actor targets. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question coming in from George Pappy. He asks, why only two critics? Could it be more? And would that be advantageous at the expense of higher complexity? Um, absolutely. You know, uh, uh, there is no limit to AI research. Uh, we could uh, invent a, a TDD uh, PG. Uh, sorry. No, uh, well, um, you know, with more than twins. Uh, but yes, absolutely. The, um, you know, if we take more than one model, you know, another critic model and its corresponding critic target, well, that uh, will allow us to get another Q value. And by taking the minimum, well, I think that would add even more regularization into it. And maybe that could improve the results. Yeah, this is a very good idea. Uh, I don't know if the research scientists tried this, but this is an idea to me that makes a lot of sense. And uh, this is worth trying. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. We have another question coming in from Miguel Garcia. He asks, why not use more than three neural networks? Why use more uh, than three neural networks? Uh, well, using more than three. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I guess this is the same question as before, right? Uh, basically, why not using some more twins, you know, some more critic models? Uh, yes, you know, why not? We could totally do this. Uh, I'm not sure if it was tried by the research scientist. I, uh, that makes me want to try. Uh, but yes, we would have some other uh, critic models. Uh, of course, we, we can't add more actor models because we just need one because that corresponds to the policy itself. But then we can totally try to add more critic models and their critic targets. We would just get more Q values and therefore uh, you know, a lower minimum. It will either be the same at the two or uh, at the previous minimum or it will be lower. And therefore, yeah, as I said in the previous question, this will add some further regularization and maybe this will improve the training performance. This is worth trying. Okay, 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 wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Jay Gendron. He asks, do we take the minimum QQ to keep a conservative approach? Um, it is not really to take a conservative approach. Um, Yes, in some so in some way, yes, it is to take a conservative approach. I, 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 I would love to discuss with uh, Jij Amrams to understand uh, what he means exactly by this question. You know, conservative approach. But I guess that what he means by that is that uh, you know we are taking some precaution with the Q value, but which exactly corresponds to the regularization process, because instead of taking the direct output of the Q value. We take the minimum of several Q values, which is why the idea of taking of adding some further critic models is good, because by taking this minimum Q value, well, that adds some re regularization into that target Q values that we want to get closer to the predicted Q values. So I'm not sure if that uh, you know corresponds to what uh, was in mind, but uh, I, I guess this is 
you know, this is all linked to regularization anyway. If by conservative was meant regularizing, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have a follow-up question from Shashan again. He asks, okay. or he says, amazing presentation. Does it work Thank in you. environments having sparse rewards? Yes, that works too. Yes, which is why um, that uh, model is super beautiful. Because it not only allows to solve some applications in very complex environments, but it also allows to, uh, you know, and by complex environments, I mean not only a 3D environment, but also the fact that all the inputs are complex and also the actions are continuous. You know, the muscle pulsations of the agents are continuous, but also it works with sparse rewards. And there is another research paper for this. Um, I could give the link, you know, after this, could be sent to the attendees. Uh, but yes, there is a slight adjustment to it, but it's very close, and this can be applied to this. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we have also another question coming in. Um, Andrew is asking, you're the CEO and co-founder of Blue Life AI. How did that company come to be? What motivated you to start Blue Life? Okay, so um, what motivated me to start Blue Life? Well, it was, first of all, a us motivation, because I started Blue Life with uh, the same business partner with whom I... Uh, uh, created all these online courses, but basically uh, we had, uh, you know, we have had great success with our online courses. This gives us a good reputation, and therefore uh, we thought uh, we would like to help companies and uh, institutions and uh, healthcare centers uh, with artificial intelligence. So for them, we wanted to build some AIs that uh, help them in their process, um, that uh, create added value. And, uh, and we were passionate about building AIs, building robots, building programs. And what we were passionate about was the fact that we could apply AI to a super, uh, super great variety of industries. And indeed, within the scope of Blue Life AI, we have applied AI to uh, space, uh, to healthcare, uh, to logistics, to luxury, to retail, uh, what else, to energy. So, you know, we have all these industries to which we can apply AI, and that's absolutely fascinating because that allows us to uh, have a rich experience of diverse projects within diverse industries, and that's just amazing. So that's really the, the why of why we, we, we founded Blue Life. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Well, we, are, we now have a, another follow-up question from Jay Gendron. Um, just to remind you, the original question he asked, he said, do we take the main QQ uh, to keep a conservative approach? He also yeah. clarified and asked, I was thinking, why min versus max? Why min versus max? Okay. Um, okay. If we took the max, then we would cheat a bit, you know, because um, we, we, we want to maximize the Q value. But if we take the max, this would not apply regularization because this would get us, you know, closer to uh, what we want to get. By taking the min, this... This adds some difficulty to the critic models and their targets to learn the Q values. So by taking the min, you know, we're adding some difficulty, just like regularization with dropout. For example, you know, we deactivate some neurons. That's to add some difficulty for the network to uh, get to the root, you know, to reach the goal. So by taking the minimum of the Q value, we add this regularization, we add the, the, this difficulty, because indeed the, the goal of the critic models is to maximize the Q values. It is to get them closer to the targets, but at the same time, the target Q values are being maximized with the other part of the model. So yeah, that, this, this just adds some difficulty. And if we took the max, this wouldn't work because this would be the opposite effect of regularization. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I, hope, um, I hope Jay really got that answer. Again, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to send them. Um, we have a next question from AC Kanner. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, the question is, what type of distance equations are used between Q and target values, Euclid Euclidean or options, while the system is learning? Okay, yeah, it's Euclidean. It's typically Euclidean because uh, we're taking the mean squared error loss, which is the sum of the square differences between the predicted Q values and the target Q values. So it's a, this is typically Euclidean, yeah. Okay, great. And now we have a question coming in from Agustin Fassi. He asks, or he says, hi, Hadlan. Um, I think in AI applied to the study of climate change, I have a question. Would it make sense to use Gaussian noise to 
quote, affect the environment model in order to obtain some exploration on environment restrictions? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, because uh, when you have a complex environment, like the ones in climate change applications, uh, well, you definitely want to do a lot of exploration. And since adding Gaussian noise is exactly for this, is exactly used for this, you know, to uh, allow to uh, optimize the exploration, well, you would definitely want to use Gaussian noise for this. Okay, great. Um, now we have a question coming in from Ravid Hain. I Again, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. He says, can you throw some more light on your book, AI Crash Course? Oh, sure. Yes, if you like this uh, presentation, uh, well, you might like AI Crash Course because this is fully a book on reinforcement learning, but also deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. So you have many applications of uh, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, and uh, deep Q-learning, and even deep convolutional Q-learning. Since this is a book that covers all the basics, all the fundamentals, and uh, you know the essential models, we don't go as far as you know the twin delay DDPG because this is really the most advanced model. But I wanted to take the challenge to explain it in two hours, including the implementation. But uh, it covers all the you know great and powerful and essential models of reinforcement learning, deep learning, and deep reinforcement learning. So yeah, you have a uh, uh, you have a lot of chapters on this where each chapter will cover the theory of the most essential deep reinforcement learning models and deep learning models. And at the same time, we have some business applications, some real world applications, which uh, will, uh, you know, allow, you know, to, you, you, which will teach how these AI models are used in the real world, you know, for real world industries. And so, yeah, I highly recommend it, but only if, you know, people have an interest in uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning. Basically, if they like this presentation, they will like the book. All right, all right, great. Uh, we also have a question coming in from D'Angelo Shakur. Um, the question is, can you see any other use cases for RL where we don't have an area to explore that represents a typical space of interaction? Space of interaction being a representative area that a human could explore if it were real. Mm. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, well, actually, in the AI crash course, I give an example of such an environment, because in the book we are, uh, we are yeah, we are building a self-driving car, but also we are doing an energy optimization problem, which is uh, an environment where, uh, you know, a, a human would not be able to interact with. Uh, it is a simple, uh, well, it, it, you know, it is an environment that takes as input some uh, energy-related features, that's the input vector, and that uh, returns as output uh, uh, the way the AI is going to cool or heat up uh, the, a server uh, in, an, in an environment. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are many um, applications of such, but uh, the reason I gave uh, you know, uh, a walking field here is just for people to help this visualize better. But absolutely, uh, this, uh, this could be applied to any environment that has some input vectors representing some features of something we want to optimize. And then the actions would be, well, the actions in order to optimize that. All right, great, great. Well, I think we have time for, for a couple more questions. Uh, we have one coming in from Tushad Mehta. Uh, he asks, well, the question is, um, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned that reinforcement learning is the closest type of AI to AGI. Could you shed some light, some more light on that statement? Exactly, that's exactly true. Uh, that's that's exactly what I meant. Yes, the reason why I said this is because the other branches of uh, artificial intelligence, such as uh, you know machine learning, or uh, you know data mining, or uh, you know uh, uh, association rule learning, well, do uh, you know simple predictions? They take as input some features, and they return as output a prediction, which can be just a predicted value or a predicted category. But here in reinforcement learning, the prediction is an action plate, just as we humans do, you know. We humans, we observe some observations as input, you know, with our eyes, and with we hear some other informations with our ear. We basically collect all these inputs when we observe the environment we are interacting with. And then as output, you know, after all the signals pass in our brain, well, we play some actions to make decisions, to move forward or to, to think or to take decisions. 
And well, the, the closer to that is, of course, reinforcement learning. Therefore, that's the closest AGI because AGI consists of trying to, you know, reach human intelligence level in, and even surpass it, but for any task, not just playing chess, for any task, general task. And so, yeah, so that's definitely the closest to that because in reinforcement learning, the input is indeed some features, some observations describing the state of the environment. And as output, well, it's an action plate, just as we humans play some actions when we live. So that's exactly what I meant by that. Well, awesome. It was it was great. It was great having you. Um, it was a very interesting Q&A uh, Q session. And thank you once again, Adlan, for joining us. Uh, My pleasure.